This is my cat, Onyx. Sometimes she likes to come up in my home office and give me a hand in the afternoon as I'm doing my work. I think right now she wants to take a nap. So maybe we'll talk about something exciting that might wake her up, like molecular mechanics. Okay, so today let's talk about molecular mechanics. Uh, these are also sometimes called force field methods. Uh, and also sometimes this word is used synonymously with molecular dynamics, although technically that's not exactly the same thing. Molecular mechanics has to do with what's the energy or what are the forces on the atoms. Uh, and molecular dynamics is then based on those forces, where would the atoms want to move and how do they move around in time. So we will set aside discussion of dynamics for now and just talk about for a molecule in a certain geometry, how would I know what the energy of that is and how would I know what the forces on the atoms are. Uh, so that's what we'll talk about today. Um, these approaches use uh, classical models. I'll ex explain what I mean by that in a second. Uh, to predict an energy of a molecule uh, as a function of its conformation. So based on the bond lengths and the bond angles and all of these kind of things. If you are able to predict that, then you can predict equilibrium geometries. Those are just the geometries that minimize the energy. Um, or you can predict uh, the geometries of transition states uh, with a few caveats. Uh, sometimes these molecular mechanics approaches are not as good uh, at uh, deformed geometries like you see sometimes in transition states. Uh, it could predict relative energies between conformers. So cis versus trans conformers of a molecule, you could predict the energy difference of that, okay. Um, and uh, so this is generally useful. Um, you can get the potential energy you would need from molecular dynamics computations, as I just mentioned. Um, but uh, I'll let you know at the outset, uh, most force field methods don't really work correctly if you literally break a covalent bond. Uh, there are a few methods that can do this. Sometimes they're called reactive force fields, and those exist, but they're um, not as well known or well used as the standard force field methods. So let's start off with the easiest part of a force field method. The easiest thing to talk about first is the stretching interaction. So if I've got a bond and I stretch the bond or I compress the bond, how does that change the energy of a molecule? Uh, what you could do is just assume some kind of Taylor series, and in fact that'll be the theme for a lot of molecular mechanics. So we'll um, suspect that the energy as a function of a bond length R um, is going to be uh, some Taylor series where I have um, some force constant K2 times the difference between the bond length and its equilibrium bond length, or its preferred bond length R sub E. Uh, and then I could tack on higher order terms like cubic terms or quartic terms, uh, etc. We would expect if the Taylor series works that the first term is dominant, the second term is a small correction, and additional terms would become smaller and smaller corrections so that in principle I shouldn't need those. Now how would I get these parameters like K1 or K2 and K3 um, and so on? Um, well, I, I could uh, do some experiments and infer that from experiment, or, or I could do some high-level quantum chemistry calculation and uh, extract it uh, out of that. Now, the central idea of force field methods is that I shouldn't have to go do this for every single molecule. Otherwise, that becomes an impossible game because there are too many molecules. Uh, the idea instead is that for a CH bond, that bond length is going to be pretty darn similar no matter what molecule we're in. It's going to be something like 1.08 angstroms plus or minus a little bit. And that's going to be pretty typical for any molecule. So if I see a molecule I haven't seen before, I could guess 1.08 angstroms and be in the right ballpark. Uh, 
Uh, similarly, this, the stretching frequencies, which is related to the force constant, K2, um, for a CH bond are between 2900 and 3300 wave numbers. And so uh, if I had to guess, I could guess 3000 wave numbers, 3100 wave numbers or something, and know that I'm in the ballpark. So the fact that these values are similar across many different molecules means that those parameters are what we call transferable. And that's a good thing, and it saves us from having to catalog every single situation. In fact, what we do is we look at the different uh, classes of situations and then just fix parameters for those. So uh, you might imagine that a, uh, a CH bond, um, you know, maybe is a little different if you're in an aromatic molecule than in a non-aromatic molecule. So you might have different parameters for those situations. And maybe you would even have different situations if you're in an sp3 versus an sp2 or an sp hybridized carbon uh, but if you distinguish into those categories then hopefully everything within that category can be lumped together with similar parameters that's the idea and it turns out this idea works pretty well uh, as i hope i've just motivated with this example of ch and the typical bond lengths and uh, vibrational frequencies um, so, um, in one of the earlier molecular mechanics force fields called MM2, uh, molecular mechanics version number two, um, there were um, a number of so-called atom types, which basically just means what are the different uh, chemical environments that an atom can be in that I need to worry about when I'm trying to catalog all these parameters like uh, K2. Uh, so here's an example see there's a bunch of different carbons there's an sp3 carbon there's an sp2 carbon when it's an alkene there's an sp2 carbon when it's a carbonyl or an imine there's an sp carbon uh, etc etc and there's quite a few examples and similarly nitrogen so it depends on the hybridization um, sometimes whether or not there's an oxygen nearby or whether you're in a nitro group or that kind of thing um, there are several different oxygens. Uh, there's a handful of hydrogens. You notice there's not a whole lot of different distinct hydrogen atom types. Uh, so it matters if you're in a carboxyl group or alcohol or an amine, but uh, otherwise there's not a whole lot of different ones there. Uh, uh, atom type 5 hydrogen is uh, except on N and O is kind of a catch-all sort of hydrogen. So they act pretty much the same in most molecules. Um, and then you see there's a few sulfurs. Notice uh, atom type 11, there's only one uh, fluoride. Uh, atom type 12, there's only one chloride. So some of the halogens don't particularly care what they're bonded to in a lot of molecules, and that's kind of good. Uh, and you notice there's a few noble gases there listed and a couple different nickel types depending on the oxidation state, whether it's uh, oxidation state 2 or 3. A couple different cobalts, etc. Um, some of your favorite um, atoms uh, may not be listed uh, on this list. It might mean that the designers of this force field never got around to developing uh, parameters for that atom, and that actually can happen. That's a drawback of force field uh, situations. So uh, the force field in general uh, as I've said, maps uh, a, a geometry of a molecule to an energy. And here's how we do that. We write the energy as a sum of stretching terms, bending terms, torsional terms. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Van der Waals terms. I have to define that too. Electrostatic terms. So that has to do with interactions between charges. And then finally, depending on which force field we're using, sometimes we talk about cross terms. Um, and if we separate out uh, the van der Waals terms and the electrostatics terms, then that tends to make the other terms more transferable. So this was a key advance in the early days of force field methods, was to pluck out uh, those van der Waals and electrostatic terms and make them separate, and then that made the other terms more well-behaved and systematic. So that was a good thing. 
Um, that allowed folks to move on from what used to be called spectroscopic force fields, where you had a force field, but it was specific to every single different molecule. And that was uh, not as easy and uh, general as uh, these more transferable force fields uh, with equations like equation two for the energy. Um, just a few words about where this all came from. Um, way back in 1930, Andrews proposed extending the spectroscopic force fields I just mentioned uh, to doing a more general molecular mechanics. Uh, in 1940, Westheimer did the only molecular mechanics uh, calculation actually done by hand to find a transition state. Uh, 1961, Hendrickson did confirmational analysis on rings with more than six atoms, and this was a big deal in the 60s and 70s. There was a lot of uh, strong interest in confirmational analysis, and force field methods were uh, handy to use for those applications. Um, Weiberg in 65 published the first general molecular mechanics program. Before that, everything had been some one-off application to this molecule or that molecule. Uh, but uh, Weiberg had the first general ability to find the minimum energy of uh, any molecule if you had the parameters. Uh, and then Allinger uh, in 76 uh, came along and published uh, the first in his MM series of force fields, which included MM1, MM2, and then ultimately MM3 and MM4. And then since that time, uh, this idea really caught on and there's been a lot of interest in development in force fields uh, over the time since that. All right, so back to the stretch energy. Let me see if this is uh, clear how we're going to do this. Um, for any pair of atoms that are bonded, A and B, the energy as a function of the distance between atoms A and B is some quadratic term, K2, times the difference between the bond length and the natural bond length, I called it RE before, here I'm calling it R0, AB. Uh, and notice that uh, term is, that uh, distance is squared. Uh, so if I stretch the bond, uh, then that energy goes up quadratically. Or if I compress the bond, then RAB is less than RAB0. I get a negative number, but I still square it. So I get a positive energy whether I stretch or compress. Um, and then I could have, if I want, cubic terms, quartic terms, and so on. Um, a lot of times, honestly, in force field methods, um, it's, uh, folks decide this is too complicated, and they just take that first term, that quadratic term, and say, it's good enough. Um, if you do that, though, um, you will get wrong behavior at long bond lengths when, in reality, you would start to break the bond, uh, and the energy should start to uh, tail off to some asymptotic value, uh, that won't happen if I take a quadratic form. The energy would just keep going up and up and up as I stretch, uh, which is not correct. Um, if you want to do better, um, one way to do that would be a function like this, uh, which still only has essentially one term, but it's a more accurate term. Uh, this is the so-called Morse potential. So I have like a well depth or dissociation energy D, uh, and then I have one minus exponential and uh, some factors there, uh, and I square the term in brackets. Um, this is more accurate uh, in terms of what uh, the energy would really be like. Um, however, if I'm way out at long distances, uh, then um, if I computed the force associated with this energy, I'd get a really small restoring force uh, pushing me back towards equilibrium because the energy has kind of flattened out at long distances in a Morse potential where I have a nice um, high repulsion at short distances and then a well and then I come up and I go towards dissociation limit. Uh, the restoring forces there near the dissociation limit are very small. And so if I were to try to optimize a molecule, uh, with these forces, and I guessed a bond length that was too big, that optimization might be slow uh, because the force is so small. So for that reason, people say, yeah, just use the quadratic term because then that'll push it down really fast because they'll have a big, big force uh, at long distances.
And so this form, although more accurate, is, is practically speaking not very popular in the community. Um, and I can illustrate this uh, with a figure I'm borrowing from uh, Frank Jensen's excellent textbooks, uh, Introduction to Computational Chemistry, uh, which uh, has a really nice chapter on molecular mechanics methods that I'm kind of following along here. Um, so what uh, is done in this figure is this is the stretch energy for methane, where I'm uh, stretching a bond and I'm comparing the exact energy, uh, which is kind of the uh, solid curve, um, with um, uh, a few approximations. Uh, so P2 is the dashed curve, the heavy dashed curve um, with a polynomial to order two, or basically just that quadratic term. So it's a parabola, and you can see it looks like a parabola. And if you're at um, very close to the equilibrium and you don't go very far in the uh, delta R direction, delta R negative meaning I compress the bond, delta R positive meaning I uh, stretch the bond, uh, if I compress or stretch by a tiny amount, P2 is a fine approximation. It, it uh, mimics the uh, solid curve very well. But if I go very far on the compressed side or very far on the stretch side, then it becomes a terrible approximation. Uh, P4 is a fourth order polynomial, uh, and that's the uh, uh, closer dashed curve. And you can see for that one, it looks pretty darn good for compressed geometries. Uh, it mimics the solid curve very well. Uh, but as I go to uh, stretched bonds, it, uh, it does better than P2, uh, but uh, eventually it just fails and it keeps going up, whereas the real curve starts to uh, level off. Uh, the Morse curve uh, is this uh, other dashed line, and it follows the exact potential very, very closely. You'll see a little difference at it long, uh, bond lengths, but uh, the difference is tiny compared to the errors of the other ones. Um, so if you wanted to look at really stretched bonds, then the Morse potential is your ticket. But a lot of times people only really want to know what's the equilibrium geometry, or they have vibrations close to the equilibrium geometry, and in that case, as a cost savings measure, P2 is actually fine and a lot more convenient. Um, those Morse potentials involve exponentials, and uh, it doesn't take long to, to do an exponential calculation on a computer. Computers are very fast, but if you were doing that for many, 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 many pairs of atoms, maybe millions of pairs of atoms, uh, it's a lot easier to uh, take that bond stretch or compression and square it and get that quickly compared to doing an exponential calculation. If you had to do that millions of times, then uh, that actually can slow down the calculation. So that's another practical reason people prefer the quadratic form over the Morse potential. Okay, so let's talk about the bend energy. Um, I could have a bond um, angle, uh, like in water, say, and if I bend the angle in water, I would expect that to cause the energy to change. Um, and we can reflect that with an equation like this one, which is just analogous to the stretching energy, uh, except now it involves bond angles, theta, uh, instead of bond lengths. Um, so the simplest possible form um, for how does the energy change if I uh, compress a bond angle or expand it would be some force constant, which depends on the identities of the three atoms. So I'll call it KABC for a bond angle ABC. And um, the difference between what the bond angle is and its desired equilibrium bond angle, uh, theta ABC zero. So I just get that difference and square it, multiply it by the force constant, and uh, there you go. So it's uh, analogous to the stretch, but it's a bend. Um, I do need to be a little careful uh, with this uh, if I approach 180 degrees um, because at 180 degrees I then suddenly become linear. I can't stretch my hands out totally linear, but you get a line. And um, then if you keep going, uh, so I approach 180 and then I keep going on the other side, then I need to have it symmetric. So 175 degrees ought to be the same thing as 185 degrees. 
and uh, that won't necessarily happen uh, unless I somehow tweak my functional form to try to enforce that. So again, a figure from Jensen where um, you can see the exact bending potential for water is the solid line again, and you can see at 180 degrees it's leveled off, and if I were to go to 100 and uh, 85, 190 and keep going, I'd get a mirror image of what's to the left of me. Um, so the uh, derivative of the energy at 180 goes to zero because uh, I'm at a local maximum. Uh, and that won't necessarily happen if I do a quadratic term uh, like I had on the previous slide, which is called P2 here. Uh, P2 is that parabola that just goes up, 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 up. So at uh, large angles approaching 180, that has just totally the wrong behavior. Uh, if I jazz it up by adding a cubic term, I get P3, which is the fine dash line, um, and um, that goes, has an energy too high near 180 degrees, um, and I can fix it uh, to get to a derivative of zero at 180 degrees uh, by this P3 prime, where I've gone in and tweaked it and enforced uh, that derivative. Um, so there I would get a mirror image as I go to angles bigger than 180, but you can see the actual energy in this case is not quite right, because I still don't have enough parameters to match that. Okay. Now let me talk about a different kind of coordinate. So far I've talked about stretches, I've talked about bends. Uh, there's another situation called out-of-plane bending. So if you think about the ammonia molecule, uh, NH3, um, I've got a nitrogen on the top uh, of a pyramid, and then I've got three hydrogens down below it. Uh, and I could talk about how does the energy change as I flatten out that pyramid. Uh, sometimes this is called an umbrella motion. Um, you could define that coordinate various ways. In this slide, we're defining it as this angle chi, um, which you can see there. And uh, I could associate an energy associated with that if I wanted. Um, and maybe I just make it a force constant times however big chi is squared. That's one example of how you could do that. Some force fields worry about this term this way. Some handle it other ways. It depends on the force field. Uh, but uh, certainly the energy will change. Uh, if I flatten out uh, something like ammonia. So uh, I may need to account for that. Okay, the torsion energy. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, this is something like if I had hydrogen peroxide, H-O-O-H, -O -O um, I could form, here's a hydrogen, uh, here's an oxygen, here's another oxygen, here's a hydrogen. Um, this thing, the energy changes if I rotate one of the uh, hydrogens around with this, one of the OH bonds with respect to the other OH bond. And uh, I need to capture that in my force field. Um, and that's done with this torsion angle, which we've depicted here. Um, this kind of torsion angle, if I look down the bond axis of the two atoms that are bonded, say the two oxygens and hydrogen peroxide, if I look down that axis, if the two end atoms line up exactly, that's called zero degrees. And then if I rotate one around, I get to things like 90. And then if I keep rotating and they're pointed in opposite directions, then I get to 180. And then I keep going around. And 360 is the same as zero. All right, now you might expect me to say the torsion potential is another Taylor series. No, in this case, uh, we don't use a Taylor series. Why is that? Well. In this case, we're much less certain that we're going to do small perturbations around a preferred angle. If I have a bond stretch, it really normally, unless I heat up the molecule a lot or something, probably won't stretch or compress very much. Bond angle in water probably doesn't compress too much or stretch too much unless I heat up the system a lot. But a torsion um, can freely rotate in most molecules, unless I have like a double bond here or something, um, rotation around these is pretty free and can just spin around. So I need a functional form that doesn't assume that I stay near the equilibrium geometry, uh, which the stretch and the bend uh, Taylor series do. Uh, so in this case, I'll use uh, 
um, instead of a Taylor series, a Fourier series. And a Fourier series is perfectly good no matter what angle I'm at, whereas the Taylor series is only good kind of near equilibrium. So, what does this look like? Well, equation 7 says I'm going to have a bunch of cosine terms, and I take my torsional angle omega, sometimes they're called tau, depending on uh, what you're reading, um, and there's an n in there. n is the order of the term in the Taylor series, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, or something like that. Uh, so I have a sum of these terms, cosine of omega, cosine of 2 omega, cosine of 3 omega, cosine of 4 omega, and each of those terms gets multiplied by a coefficient, v, a, b, c, d, sub n, and I add all those up and I get a, a torsional potential. Um, now, um, sometimes this is kind of rewritten in a way to make sure that the energy never goes negative, uh, and frequently you chop it off at about three terms, n equals three is the maximum, um, so that could get you something like equation 8, which is just a kind of a rewritten version of equation 7. So that's kind of typical. Now if I have a molecule like ethylene, ethylene is a C2H4, so I've got a double bond uh, of two carbons and then I've got four hydrogens around that. Um, that needs to be periodic because if I start rotating ethylene, of course I'd break a double bond, so that's a little bit high energy. Uh, but if I start rotating this around, by the time I get to 180, I'm back where I started. Uh, so I need to be periodic there. And that means, uh, it turns out, only even terms in the Fourier series can contribute, like n equals 2, n equals 4, etc. Uh, molecules like ethane, where I've got three hydrogens on either carbon and just a single bond, um, have odd terms, uh, like n equals 3, n equals 6, etc. So uh, uh, out of Jensen's book, he illustrates kind of what these Fourier terms look like. So you can see the top panel, uh, I've got cosine 3 omega. Uh, and what that 3 omega means is if I go from 0 degrees to 360 degrees, um, I get 3 uh, maxima or 3 minima. You can see that it's a maximum at 0 degrees and I hit another maximum at 120, and another maximum at 240, and then 360 is the same as zero. So there's a total of three maxima or three minima there. Uh, if I look at cosine two omega, uh, then I get um, two maxima uh, or two minima, uh, whichever one you're looking at. And again, zero is the same as 360, so those don't count as different ones. Um, okay, so I think you get the idea of the periodicity of these functional forms. Uh, if I just had n equals 1, then that's simple. There's one maximum and one minimum.